Um, I'd like to welcome you to the NAL First Thursday program. This is our first in-person program that we're having this year. So it's really nice to see a room filled with uh, smiling faces and lots of people online. Thanks for joining us. Today is March 7th, 2024. I'm your program committee lead, Lisa Spence. And uh, just as a public service announcement for everybody, tomorrow is March 8th, which is International Women's Day. So please celebrate appropriately. I um, also want to let you know, uh, as a public service announcement, that we will be having a spring social for NAL members and your guests on Wednesday, April 17th. Tickets are already available on the NAL website, as is all of the information about the agenda for the evening and our speaker. And I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to make you go to the website to see who that's going to be. So we have uh, a little bit of a, a different kind of program today. Um, and it's a really very, very special program. We have several special guests who are joining us today. Um, we're gonna hear from one of our very own, Norm Chaffee. He's on his way here. Trust me, he's on his way here. Um, but we wanted to go ahead and get started. So um, he's gonna share some stories. Hopefully he'll share some stories that won't embarrass anybody in the room or online, um, but he'll be sharing some stories about his career and more especially about some of the work that he has done um, with education outreach. So prior to that, that did. there we go. All right, um, and at this point in time, I want to introduce Mr. James Loftus. And if that name sounds familiar to you, some of you who were around um, during the Apollo program and for years after that, his father was a longtime employee at the Johnson Space Center. I'm not gonna tell you a whole lot about him. I'm gonna leave that to Mr. Loftus to share with you. And ordinarily, I would provide a bio for our speaker, and he started to tell me all about himself, and I, I had several different thoughts. One was, dadgum, this guy can't keep a job. <laughs> and, and the other one was like, when I grow up, I want to be him, you know, because it all sounded very, very fascinating. So I'm going to let him tell you all about that. And he does have a presentation for us today. Um, one little thing that I will tell you that he shared with me is that he has spent some time this week here in the grand state of Texas searching for dinosaur bones. And he found some. Not only did he find some, but one of the bones that they found had some soft material, which they are now doing some um, DNA processing on. So pretty cool. It made me long for the days that I was in a, a molecular biology lab, but not that much. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Loftus. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, good afternoon, welcome. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Estella and uh, Lisa Spence, uh, you folks uh, for being here and allowing me to share this time. Uh, most importantly, my wife, um, because without her, I wouldn't be able to do all the different things that I do because she is literally my backbone. And we've been married for 36 years, have two beautiful children, uh, Caitlin and Megan. I wanna thank uh, Paul Ruggles and one of my board members, Raymond Sebesta. A uh, little bit about myself is, uh, I, I, well, let me back up. Lisa said that there was supposed to be a speaker in front of me, and so I would only be limited to 45 minutes. Um, but we spoke earlier today, and she's given me the rest of the afternoon. So please get comfortable. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to start off. I was born uh, in November of 1963. <laughs> so we've gotten past that. Uh, so I'm a former uh, elected official, uh, city councilor for the city of state, and I uh, did that for four years. Uh, we see Norm is arriving. Perfect. Great timing. Um, I have uh, run a computer company, and um, I have uh, run a government surveillance political intelligence organization. Uh, but right now, I'm running a bed and breakfast and... Uh, 
we have a little micro museum inside the cafe that has some space artifacts from my father's collections and then uh, what we've applied for through the GSA. And through the GSA, we were time out. Okay, I'm being told time out. Sorry about that for folks online. You can't see what's going on. All right, now that we've uh, overcome our technical obstacles, uh, and Norm is here, we can really get started. Um, so I left off with the introduction of my background. Um, in 2005, my father passed away, so we, we had sold our farm, and uh, my wife ended up buying a uh, house built in 1898. It's a Queen Anne Victorian, and we converted the cafe and bed and breakfast. So now I'm a hydrostatic engineer. I wash dishes for life. <laughs> um, and uh, we've actually been nominated and been selected as the uh, for four years in a row as one of the best restaurants in the Willamette Valley. So my wife and I uh, run a cafe and bed and breakfast. And inside of that is our little micro museum. It's some display cases of artifacts that were in my dad's uh, collection or possession when he passed away. Since then, um, you know, we are a 501c3. We were able to apply for uh, different NASA artifacts. Uh, so Norm was uh, Norm Chaffee was instrumental in getting us an RD4100 rocket engine. Um, so we have that. It's something that's small. It's portable. Uh, I can let it, you know, the kids' hands. So uh, that's one of the things that we do. We actually have hands-on. Uh, exciting tales that uh, Norm has shared with these students. And then uh, we were also awarded a pair of uh, lunar excursion over. James, Peggy's uh, late husband, was instrumental in uh, helping us get those uh, those boots. So we're grateful for that. And that's why we're here. She gave me the name of the person for Oregon that was heading it up. And uh, so I called her up and I said, listen, I know uh, this is not a sanctioned event, but it's a unique opportunity. And uh, she said yes. And so I called the superintendents of all these schools and I set up a square account. And uh, I actually negotiated a 65% off gate ticket price at Johnson Sp or Space Center Houston, uh, which kind of surprised Norm because he only gets 50%. <laughs> like, how did I'm gonna I'm gonna hire you the next time I buy a new car? <laughs> so, um, our uh, our mission kind of shifted a little bit. We we'll call it mission creep here. Um, so we contacted Norm back and and said, Norm, uh, we have over 270 students. So I called Norm and I said, Norm, if I were to give you a schedule, uh, would you help put the 270 students through there if I got you some help? And you, if anybody knows Norm, he, was, he, he, he will teach you, even if you're old, you can learn something from this. And that is, is that when somebody comes and asks you a question, your answer should always be yes, regardless of the outcome, but then say, can I have some time to think about the resources I'll need to pull it off? Because that gives you an out because you can put it back on the other guy and go, that's too expensive. I can't afford it. So I learned that from Norm. <laughs> so Norm says, uh, you know, let me see what I can do. In the meantime, uh, I called uh, uh, Philip Butler and uh, Philip was a... Uh, a graduate of the uh, West Albany High School in Albany, Oregon, and was a classmate of um, my my wife. And so he was also the uh, chief of um, flight crew simulation software engineer. I probably don't have the title correct, but uh, he also was able to uh, participate. And I didn't realize that I had set this on timing. So you can see... Um, Robert Phillips with the Ben team on the, the screen here. And you can see Norm here at the Rocket Park. So um, after we had pulled this off, which quite frankly was a miracle, I called up Norm and, um, sorry, I'm trying to get this to go back. I called up Norm and I said, uh, Norm, I got like $3,500 left in my account that I didn't have when we started. I'd like to write a grant and uh, create a program called the Rural Schools Education Initiative. And uh, 
I'd like you to go visit some of these kids in these remote areas of the state where, you know, our population in some of these counties are less than 25,000 people uh, to give you an idea. And so as this thing is strolling through, you're going to see some of the classes that participated. We went to, uh, uh, we actually brought Jim McBaron and Norm out to this one school that had 35 kids between um, kindergarten and high school. This is uh, Neil Hutchinson on the right. You can see, oh, let me go back. Uh, that's James and Peggy McFerrin. That's my wife next to me. And the gentleman on the other side from Neil is Congressman Denny Smith, who's on our board of directors. So I thought I'd bring that up because uh, I didn't take very many pictures. I was more focused on uh, talking with the kids and making sure we got things scheduled out. So... Uh, in 2018, we created the Rural Schools Education Initiative, and um, we got the sponsorship necessary. And Norm graciously agreed to spend two weeks of his time, and we went to different communities. Is there any way to get this to pause? No, there's not. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, folks, for in the background, you're going to see these slides going back and forth. Um, so we uh, scheduled... Over the two weeks, we drove about 1,900 miles. Uh, we talked to about 3,500 kids and about 700 adults in different community settings. Uh, the one here uh, on the slide before it changes, let me go back to it. The one where Norm's holding his rocket engine um, is a really interesting story because we went out to, uh, it's one of five locations in the United States. It's the Pendleton UAS Mission Control Facility, and that stands for un unmanned aerial systems and uh, we were there for two years first year that picture was taken um, we had one kid uh, out of 450 students that was bus through there um, he didn't really listen to norm he listened to him for a little bit but then he went and started playing around with the virtual reality system and the director of the facility went over and engaged him and ended up hiring him Oh. Yeah, it turns out he was one of the best coders that he could have ever encountered. It was a natural ability for this child. And we didn't know about it until the next year when we showed up. And he was like, yes, James, yes, please come back, you know, because we did, we wouldn't have found that nugget had you not been here. Um, so you never know what kind of impact you're going to have on these students um, or even adults, uh, to be quite frank with you. So in this photograph, uh, you can see a photograph here of uh, Jim. Darn it. Um, Jim McBaron, and uh, this is the school I was telling you about that the kindergarten through high school, they actually had to bus two schools together in this remote area of Oregon just so that they could participate in this. Um, I'm sorry again of the technical issues here that we're having. Um, and then on the, on the other side of Norm Holden the rocket engine, that actually, I believe that whole session has been videotaped um, and is online at jplmuseum.org. And that really gets to the core of kind of the presentation that we would do with these students. Um, I would start off with uh, kind of a comment that, you know, I know that there's two, two types of people in this world. Those that look up when they, when they walk around and they can see the majesty and the beauty of life. And those that look down and they kind of miss that. And I said, well, you know, Norm at one point in time, he looked up and uh, he put a man on the moon. But now he has to look down and he kind of looks like Yoda when he's got his staff in his hand. But that's so he won't fall down. And, you know, the kids would get a big laugh out of that. But then Norm would get up there and share his wisdom. And it was done in such a humorous way that he was engaging these kids to actually think not only about chemical processes, but about pitch, roll and yaw. And uh, how education, it doesn't matter where you come from, but how education is the number one thing. That is, if you can teach yourself how to learn and you can learn how to learn, then you have the sky's the limit. And that's really the message that we try to inspire these kids with. Uh, Jim was very much the same way, only he would use humor about how many times he almost got killed being a test subject for my father, uh, not only for uh, my father, but for the Air Force. And um, it was very humorous. And with Jim's message, um, it, it was an incredible message because uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with this story, but um, 
when they were doing the full, full fuel mock-up for John Glenn um, for his orbital flight, when he was getting out of it, it ripped. And so Jim took the initiative to hand it to an astronaut, send it to Ohio, uh, called the Ohio State Police, had to meet the astronaut so they could accompany it to the facility, called the director of the facility, woke him up, got a seamstress down there, and they fixed the system or the suit, flew it back to Florida for pre-flight authorization. Then there's a manager's meeting, and I, I'm sorry, I forget the uh, Polish engineer's name, uh, so you'll have to forgive me. But uh, he calls together the meeting, and um, they get to Jim in the flight suit. And the, the manager goes, I should have you arrested. And Jim's in shock. And so he dismisses everyone out of the meeting, and he goes, James, you took a classified garment off <laughs> campus without my consent. And that's a violation of the National Secrets Act. He says, if you would have asked for my permission, I would be giving you an accreditation for this. You saved the mission and you saved my butt, but I can't have 44 cowboys out there doing that kind of stuff. So he was trying to make a point to everybody in the meeting, not just James, but so James tried to share with you, you know, make a decision. Decisions have consequences. Be ready to, to live up to it and take responsibility. So we try to share that with folks. Um, this is, again, fast forwarding a little bit. So the second year that we took Norm up, um, we're driving around out in the middle of nowhere, um, covering some beautiful territory. I took her, uh, took him out to uh, Crater Lake National Park. And if you guys haven't ever been there, I suggest you go there. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And um, so we went out there and uh, I'm going to leave that alone for a second. <laughs> <laughs> We uh, ended up at uh, Kingsley Air Force Base and then at Kingsley High School. And um, we uh, did our presentation to about, uh, I want to say it was close to 35, 40 aerospace engineers in high school. They actually have a four-year high, high school aerospace engineering degree at Kingsley High School. Wow. Yeah. And they're prepping them to go right into Kingsley Airfield. Um, but we were leaving and this physicist comes running out and she grabs a hold of Norm and I and gives us the biggest hug that we had ever had from a teacher. And she says, I was gonna lose two of my best and brightest students. And until you came in here and actually told them what it's going to take uh, they were going to give up, but now they know, and now they have a mission. And that was a, uh, that was a huge honor to, uh, to be able to, and she goes, you know, who paid for this? You know, who put this together? And I said, it was just kind of on the whim. And, um, you know, we were able to raise money from Pacific Corps and some other corporate sponsors, and, uh, they really are interested in education and outreach. So, um, so that's one of the, successes that I would suggest say that we had. Um, I kind of lost track with my PowerPoint slide being out of order. So um, <laughs> we're getting there. I'm trying to get it. So there. while we're out driving around out in the middle of nowhere, Oregon, I asked him, is there any way that we could put together some kind of like once a month? Um, well, actually, Norm uh, brought up that when uh, he was an education director, uh, he had his own little television broadcast studio and that uh, they would broadcast to different schools, similar to how we're doing Zoom meetings nowadays. And so I uh, had Norm introduce me over to the Space Center Houston, and they have a NASA approved curriculum and they have a NASA uh, present center. And so uh, we wrote a couple of grants to uh, to fund what we call our radios program. You know how NASA likes their acronyms, right? And this is retro um, for, the, uh, for the name. Radio stands for Remote and Distant Interactive Online Sessions. And so the idea is, is that the different smaller schools would log in and then they would be able to participate with a NASA presenter. And we're going to cycle through to that photograph here. So on the 
uh, upper side over here on your to your left, you can see the NASA presenter in the corner, and then the different schools at this uh, in this particular um, session, and in the lower corner. Um, Norm had invited me to uh, participate. I should say Norm and Anita Gale. Um, give her credit because uh, the year before we were talking and she actually helped me sponsor uh, a group of kids to Florida for the international competition uh, that they held in Florida. And then the next year they invited me to come up as a, I guess, a judge, um, an observer, and um, I, I learned so much uh, about just interaction with the kids and the environment and then what they were trying to do that uh, hopefully over time we'll be able to get some recruits uh, because robotics is the next wave. We see these kids that are, you know, they're in third grade now building little robots that go around on a little Lego platform. And, and that's just amazing to me. Um, so we're hoping to, you know, bring more and more of these types of opportunities. I, I kind of look at it. There's an ocean of resources here at Johnson Space Center, but there's not enough pipelines going out into the other areas of the nation trying to deliver this educational content. So I kind of would like to say it that way because it kind of gives you a visual representation. Maybe I should, since we're in Texas, say it. You guys have the oil reservoir here. We just need to pump the oil out to get these kids engaged. And uh, I truly believe that uh, it's the generation that's right here, right now, that's going to be able to occupy another planet. And uh, and it's going to be because of people like Norm that gave them the inspiration. People like James McBaron who protected them because if you think about a spacesuit, uh, it, it literally is your your cocoon. It's your Earth. And um, we need to share that knowledge with this next generation. So, uh, so our radios program was created to try to provide these unique educational opportunities where they can actually engage um, with the presenter. And Norm was kind enough to, uh, to actually do a cameo. And so whenever you can get a, a retired NASA alumni league member to come over and do a cameo on these broadcasts, you really want, you really see the engagement of these kids. It's like, you know, before they're, they're kind of playing off on the side or asking questions that maybe not have any uh, relevance to the, the topic, but then all of a sudden this cameo person walks onto the screen and everybody gets really serious about the questions that they want to ask. So um, we've been very fortunate to, uh, to be able to provide these opportunities to, uh, to have James McBaron and Peggy come up um, that one was, uh, that was, uh, that was pretty hard. Um, we were about halfway into, uh, our rural schools education program and we were out in Baker city, Oregon. That, that type of thing, doing a little writing about it. And so that's been and, uh, a wonderful, a, a wonderful thing. The other thing is that I, I love to go talk. And no one can ever find somebody who could come and say, Norm, could you? I'd say, yes. Because <laughs> uh, I, I love to do that. And, uh, you know, once I run out of talking about Norm Chappie things, I talk about Texas A&M and, you know, they're important uh, topics from our part of the uh, part of the country. I, I love uh, learning with kids. Uh, I can learn well all by myself, but it's so much more fun working with a group of kids and asking them to, here, you read this set of, set of, uh, uh, of records about some, some topic it's going to be important. And you, you go and tell me what ideas do you see are most likely useful from the set, set of things you've been exposed to that we might can pick them up and say, let's, let's do a one, two, two, three and see why we can, we can uh, you know, classify that way. 
So you know, I, I, I love to do that. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, we get it on our own and uh, I look at come forward and said, well, you're completely overlooking, you know, our ability to, you know, have the quick start campfire or the self-eating watermelon or something like that, you know. So uh, I, I just love getting into these things at the level at which it makes, it makes sense. It, you can see written in an area in which work can be done, should be done, will be done, and uh, it will have the, the best payout. And I think there's so many areas like that in so many areas adjacent to these these things with the with the ex explorative and interest and power of the human body and mind who, you know, want, want to go and, and die and be buried on a, on a far planet just so they could say they, they did that, but they're also going forward to stake out some new territory for somebody, for them, for their country, for the world, for whatever. Those are the kind of people we need to we need to have in our storage system. I'm sure there's a there's a lot of people like that that we're not aware of, perhaps set in our uh, solar system. And one of these days they'll they'll decide to they make themselves known to us perhaps. Anyway, exploration is a wonderful wonderful topic. And the result of exploration is an even more wonderful topic. And when you see what you can do with all these things as you gradually build one topic, one finding on another, uh, you can just see how this can just completely run away with you. And I think uh, I think that's where the, the, the planet is going to be in the next 25, 30 years. I remember one, yes. Oh, uh -oh yeah, I've got, a, I've got some handouts. <laughs> uh, one of the, one of the uh, space settlement design competitions that we ran oh, on the order of four, 20 years ago was a was a trackless train that roamed I'm not quite I'm sure that I remember what it roamed but we had <laughs> cleverly picked out a, a planet somewhere that this, Mercury. This Mercury. Yeah, Mercury. Good Rome. I need to see and, and, Mercury. And but yeah, well, you know, Mercury. That sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it would it would find its it would uh, uh, do do forward surveys, see what looked interesting, what was promising. What fit in with something that would go in and then lay out rough, rough planning for activities like that, uh, the likes of which no human had ever uh, could consider possible. And I, I remember the, this train that had no track, but it had, it had a solar power. System and uh, it, it had a, a large population because we were we were we were uh, exploring a, a fairly large uh, planetary body 
in the middle solar system. But you can, in order you can, to keep this thing under a sunny spot, and you could predict the sunny spot, it would take with a minimum of hour, hour, hour run take you another hundred miles the next day and provide you energy to live and cook and bathe and things like that. Well, that was just came out of one like six or eight months. And plucking your ideas out of you know, the heads and then sending off uh, uh, working groups to come on make it more interesting, more reasonable, throw out the stuff that's not reasonable. But uh, uh, those kind of things need to be part of every youngster's future. And even even if it turns out, oh my God, I couldn't stand it. You know, I want to try more oil or whatever. <clears throat> at least they've, <clears throat> they've had a, a chance to take a look at doing something like that and see what it feels like to be successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's the thing that's going to contribute to the long-term Health and success of a human uh, race and human complex in the uh, uh, solar system. Thank you, Norris. Um, you kind of got a little ahead of me, but that's perfectly okay because we're just winging this whole thing with the technology problems we've had and. Um, but at this point in time, I'd like to ask uh, Taylor to come up. Um, so we went to Congressman Cliff Bentz, and I'm going to have her read the congressional record that Cliff entered on behalf of James McBaron. And while she does that, I'm going to go get the flag that was flown over the U.S. Capitol building and present that to Peggy. Taylor. Thank you guys for having us today. I really appreciate it. Okay. It says, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor the memory of the late NASA engineer, James McBurn II, and to recognize his lifetime achievements and commitment to inspiring countless students in rural Oregon through the Rural Schools Education Initiative. Throughout his 38 year career at NASA, from 1961 to 1999, Mr. McBurn II contributed to the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, Space Shuttle, and International Space Station missions. He began his career in 1961 as an aerospace technologist with the Crew Equipment Branch Life Sciences Division Space Task Group at Langley Field, Virginia. His positions throughout his career included working as the Crew Chief Crew Systems Division, CTSD Chief Engineer for EVA Projects, and Spacesuit Systems Manager. He earned numerous prestigious awards for his achievements, including the American Astronautical Society Victor A. Prather Award for outstanding contribution in the field of EV protection in the space in 1979, and awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Nixon in 1971 as a member of the Apollo 13 Missions Operation Team. Mr. McBaron II assisted the promotion of the Rural Schools Education Initiative Program in Oregon, which helps bring retired NASA engineers to rural areas in Oregon to share their stories and inspire young students. By sharing his story and experience with, with Oregon students and community leaders, he inspired hundreds of students to reach their stars and to continue their education and enjoy their work while being successful. On behalf of Oregon's second congressional rec district, I ask my colleagues to join me in honoring the life and accomplishments of Mr. James McBaron II. So folks back home can see this. Um, in addition to the uh, congressional record, and I'll show you a copy of that in just a moment. Um, let's see here. I don't know how to. 
Um, Cliff Bentz, uh, Congressman Bentz's office, I don't know. Is that like reflecting everything? Mm -hmm. All right, so we have the uh, Capitol building and Wow, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. <laughs> it's like it, it's invisible. We also have the uh, a certificate of the congressional record uh, or the flag being flown over the Capitol building. And then we have a U.S. flag um, that was flown. And so uh, it, they're identical to uh, um, the one that I presented to uh, Peggy McFerrin, to the one that I'm presenting here to, uh, to Norm Chaffee. And Paul, would you mind grabbing that for me? And then would you hand that to uh, to Kathy? Thank you. Or to Norm, actually, <laughs> since he's there. Thank you very much. And then I'm going to get you, I'm going to hand this to you. We're going to get a photograph. So, uh, again, I don't know if I can get the right angle for... Um, all right, I'm going to take a picture of this and post it on our website. Uh, <laughs> so that uh, you can appreciate uh, the beautiful frame that it's in. Um, and so uh, I would like to read this. Uh, it was done uh, Tuesday, July 18th, 2023. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor retired NASA engineer, Norman Chaffee, and to recognize his achievements and outstanding efforts in inspiring countless rural students across Oregon through the Rural Schools Education Initiative Program. Throughout his 37-year career at NASA, Mr. Chaffee held several positions at NASA Johnson Space Center from 1962 to 1998. He contributed to the Mercury Program, Gemini, Apollo, Lunar and Mars Exploration Program. Mr. Chaffee has received numerous awards in recognition of his accomplishments, including JSC Engineer of the Year 1987, NASA Exceptional Service Medal of 93 in 1991, a recognition from the state of Texas for his efforts in education outreach and many more well-deserved awards and citation. Continuing as a devotion to education, Mr. Chaffee has continued to sustain a commitment for education and science, having served as the manager of space settlement design competition for high school students from 1999 to 2012, and to continue to be a champion for STEM. After retiring in November of 1998, Mr. Chaffee held helped to create a unique hands-on experience for students in Oregon. In 2017, he led, led a personal tour of the NASA's robotic lab at Johnson Space Center in Houston for students competing in the 2017 International Robotics World Championship. Over 250 Oregon high school students participated in this experience. His remarkable work has served to promote science, technology, robotics, engineering, art, math, and medicine educational opportunities to, to Oregonians of all ages. On behalf of Oregon's sec, 2nd Congressional District, I ask my colleagues to join me in honoring Mr. Chaffee today. So I ask you folks here today and those uh, out on internet land to uh, honor Norm Chaffee and his uh, dedication to NASA and our community and to the outreach that he has done in Oregon and everywhere else trying to inspire children. And with that, I'm gonna go present this to him. Uh, it is truly my honor to present this to you. And um, I hope you will put that on one of your walls in your office. And when, you look, at, when you look at that, you will, uh, you'll remember all those kids that you got to have in the So uh, thank you guys very much uh, for being here. And, um, I'd like to also get a picture of me presenting that that uh all right. So, so while this presentation is being done here in the room, I know that people online cannot see it and probably cannot hear it. You were already prepared, but yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. And you know, going to that one from the schoolhouse was Jim's pride. I know, I know. That's that's that was quite an experience. I think you really realize how good you really were at that point. It made me chilly for us. Sally, the here, so So, uh, 
I have one other special guest I'd like to share with you. He kind of beats all of us in history. All right, you want to go back up to Mike? All right. All right, I'm back. Uh, Norm will recognize this character. Uh, this is actually one of our Project Mercury space chimps. Uh, this is Phil, number 174. And um, believe it or not, um, I had a gentleman walk into our restaurant and said, don't open the box while you're open. And I go, why? And he goes, you'll find out. Just don't open the box. So, of course. So after we closed, I opened the box and I'm left with this chimp skull. And it turns out that his father was the chief veterinarian pathologist at Holloman Air Force Base. And so he donates this to the museum. And immediately I go, we got to find history on this character. Yeah, right. What and what's really interesting, and I didn't put it together, was that my brother was at a bar in Northwest Houston. Okay. About a month before this. And he's having a drink with a gentleman named Mitch Cook. Mitch Cook's father plays a role in this because as it takes time to track down uh, a gentleman named Bill Britz, he was, uh, he was the handler for a lot of the Project Mercury Space Champs. So was Jerry Finnick. And it turns out that Jerry Finnick is 93 years old, lives in Bastrop, Texas. Oh, good. And I was able to track him down, thank God for the internet, and I was able to track down Bill Britz. And so Bill was kind enough to scan his journal in and um, it took him like a week or so to do so. And, and then I spent a couple of days digging through it. And I came to 174 of the Project Mercury Space Chimps and it said his country of origin, the birth date, his name Phil, and then next to his name in big bold letters is GE and it's circled. So immediately I think General Electric, they're a prime contractor for NASA. And uh, so I call up Bill and I go, Bill, Bill, I found Phil. And he goes, whoa, whoa, James, slow down. How do you know it's him? And I said, well, the bag says 174 on it. And your journal says that's Phil. And he goes, James, that bag could be a lot number or a shelf location number. Where the heck did you get it from? And I said, well, I made friends with this guy, David Prine. He came in and donated it to the museum. And he goes, well, your providence is good. I knew his father, Colonel James Prine. He was chief veterinarian pathologist at Holloman Air Force Base. I'm just not convinced. And I said, well, Bill, I didn't want to admit this, but I dropped Phil. And when I was putting his jaw back on, I noticed somebody had etched into the top plate of his mouth, Phil, number 174. So Phil goes, well, that's pretty conclusive evidence if you ask me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's this GE? And the phone goes dead. I'm like, Bill? 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 I'm about to hang up. And then all of a sudden I hear, James, I'm 93 years old. And that stands for the great escape. And I said, oh, you got to tell me this story. He goes, no, no, no. I need to tell you about Colonel James Cook. I was 19, maybe 20. It doesn't matter. I love my job. And these chimps were like my babies. And we got a new commanding officer of the consortium. That's what they called the chimp cages. And Colonel Cook comes in and gives us, we got a new commanding officer and the Colonel comes in, gives all his handlers a standing order that anytime the alpha males are put through an extreme stress test, we had 10 minutes to locate the Colonel. Mm -hmm. James, I saw him leave chow in the middle of a meal. The funny thing is he'd go into the cage, he'd bring a banana, a Coke, a cigar, and a piece of chalk. And he'd give it to the chimp in that order. He'd give him the banana, give him the Coke, he'd light the cigar, give him the cigar, and then he'd sit down and play tic-tac-toe. These chimps are very intelligent, very competitive. They knew sign language. Mm -hmm. And he'd sit there and chit chat with them. After about 45 seconds to a minute, he'd intentionally lose. And that chimp would get up and beat his chest, parade around smoking a cigar, sit down inside and play again. Oh, James, he'd do this 10, 20, 30 minutes at a time. We thought he was crazy. Mm -hmm. It was about a year later. It was my day off and the air raid siren went off and I ignored it. A few minutes later, the colonel rushes in and says, Bill, grab your leashes. We've had an escape. Mm -hmm. Well, heck, James, I'm thinking like one or two, but as I go out to get in the back of the long bed of Jeep, it was pure pandemonium. Imagine 250 air patrolmen chasing 19 African chimps across the Mexican desert. Oh, no. And then he paused and he says, those chimps, they can cover 50, 75 feet in a matter of seconds, and they're strong enough to remove any of your appendages, forget about their teeth. 
Well, anyways, the colonel and I would get in the Jeep. We do this flanking maneuver, get out in front of them. And all of a sudden, the colonel pulls over, turns off the engine, puts his feet up on the dash and lights a cigar like he doesn't have a care in the world. <laughs> Bill's in the back of the Jeep squirming in his seat going, what are we doing? Why have we stopped? Where are my babies? He goes, James, I swear it couldn't have been more than 45 seconds, maybe a minute. Those chimps must have smelled that cigar smoke because they come rushing over the top of that sand dune. The colonel jumped up, popped open a Coke, and they stopped dead in their tracks. Mm -hmm. Bill gets out of the Jeep. They all rush to get into the Jeep, (laughs) sit down, cross their legs, and go like this. And the colonel put cigars in their hands, lit them up. Bill put leashes on their neck, and they drove right back to the cages. (laughs) The next day, the colonel authorized Jerry Finnegan and Bill Britz to put in a 30-foot wide, 10-foot deep concrete line, double electric fence moat system, and they never had an escape after that. (laughs) So I would just like to say thank you for this coming in. And this was part of our show, and I think Phil would have been really upset if he didn't get to say goodbye to Norm one last time. (laughs) And besides that, we took him to the DNA lab in Glen Rose at the museum there to extract some DNA so I could learn that whole process. So that's why I was there. Uh, Are there any questions that I can answer while I'm up here? Otherwise, I'd like to kind of conclude my portion of it and, uh, you know, let Norm kind of tell you some stories. I want to remind you, you said you have a bunch of pictures that are in the desk. Yes, um, they are. So get those to the alumni league, we'll post them. Okay. So I have uh, a bunch of photographs of the early days, and I'm, I would really like to know um, who some of these people are. <laughs> and I actually have one photograph. I don't know if I should share this, but... Um, it was an early day of Photoshop because it's a, it's a Mercury spacecraft. You have all these technicians standing there. So I have the original photograph and then somebody took a razor blade and very carefully cut between all the faces and inserted this person. And I have that picture. I have the modified one and then I have the finished one. And it's always bothered me. Who is this guy and why did he have to be in that photograph when he wasn't there? So I would be really curious if anybody could identify him because he's a man in black. (laughs) That's a little joke there, guys. (laughs) All right, Lisa, shall I turn this over to you? How do you uh, how do you want to conclude this? Do we have any other questions right now? Any other questions? All right. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Um, At at this point, what I'm going to do, uh, and for those of you online, this could be absolutely hilarious, um, but I'm going to move my computer in front of Norm. Uh, Norm is going to give us a few few words, um, and I'd like for you to be able to see him. So uh, bear with me for just a few minutes while I try to move the computer without dropping us offline again. <laughs> so I'm going to try to move this just a little bit so we can see you. Okay, how's that? And I'm going to get to the microphone. Yeah. Okay. 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 You're the star of the show now. Well, uh, at first, I was going to recognize some of the <coughs> so some of the names that were up there. Okay. Yep. Don Hagar and George Salazar. Yeah, go ahead and hold the mic. <coughs> Real <Bob close>. Brown. <coughs> There's an interesting interesting uh, and very accomplished name I see on the second row there, uh, Elena Elena Marin. Uh, she is a uh, uh, an outstanding uh, nuclear engineer. Uh, are you familiar with with Elena Marin? 
Yes. No, I'm starting. Right, right under <laughs> Xavier's phone. <laughs> I've got to, I've got to call her up and tell her that she's on, she's on your, your honors list here. So uh, she's actually watching. She can see. Oh, she is. Yeah, she's okay. watching you right now. Okay. You just can't see her. Okay, baby. Well, I know you. You got a big, uh, a big grin on your face, and uh, when all this is over and we're uh, subject to less, less uh, oversight, maybe <laughs> we can both have a grin on our face with a little bit of a booze or. Something that, uh, that, will, uh, that will make some sense, but uh, no, I, I, I've got to tell you that I I quit drinking a number of years ago, and uh, I got to my got to my quota and uh, stopped, <laughs> and then uh, James brought me out of retirement. <laughs> and I, I moved the peg one more spot and then decided I better quit. So I, I am I am still still quit. So okay, did you want to talk about your past? But, uh, I said you talk about your past activities. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna talk about about how I got into education outreach because <clears throat> I was always as a, as a as a son and daughter advocate for going back to school night or you know visit visit your your student in class or whatever I would never miss one of those sessions unless I was going to be out of town on a very important piece of business or something like that. <clears throat> and so I loved uh, offering my services up to the various teachers to say, could I, uh, you know, I'd be happy to come, uh, you know, talk 30 minutes or 45 minutes to your class about uh, uh, space program issues. And what can, what can we possibly do in, in the near term? And uh, how likely is that going to be? And, and uh, are we really going to uh, get into deep space? Or is that uh, something that the physics indicate is just not something that is uh, up, up, up our way? And I still don't know what the answer is. To those of her, but it, yeah, it's fun to dream. It's fun to dream. And you, you look out at night, and I, I love to look out on a, on a nice uh, moonless night when uh, the, the stars are bright. That's blah, 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 blah. <laughs> whatever. It is. Or deep in the heart of Texas. And you can see some really really nice uh, uh, sky settings in uh, in Texas during most parts of the year and I just look to go try to find my friend friends some of the some of the, the groupings of stars whose names I have to go uh, read, read, acquaint myself with and uh, that type of thing, but uh, ever since I was a, a young child, uh, astronomy has been uh, a thing of great interest to me, and uh, I've learned so much after studying and studying and studying, and uh, I remember why I never could figure out why the, the stars changed position. And uh, I finally didn't realize that they are always moving. And so stars that are close 
close in uh, tend to be moving relatively faster and uh, vice versa. And so I still am puzzled by that a lot of times. And I, I go to the JSC uh, Astronomy Club and have to ask about why is why is this this grouping of stars now looking completely different than it looked, you know, a billion years ago or something. And, uh, and of course, there's there's a uh, there's real answers to, to those kind of things, but yeah. <clears throat> I I I am a person who's who is a why 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 thing, and I encourage my kids to you know that, well you know do you know why she put she put soda pop and and uh, and uh, uh, some. What's the one, one with that? Mentos. With that? Mentos. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah mentor, something like that. You get a, you get a, 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 a reaction. <laughs> and it's completely explainable. And uh, it's, it's very, very interesting. And I have to go back and, and, and re-educate myself. Periodically, the older, the older I get, the more, the more withdrawn I, I am from understanding the, the, the explanation of some of these kind of things. I remember early on when my my assignment was was over and. Uh, Let's see what where where did uh, uh, Alec Bond have his office over on Telephone Road or something in the very early days? Anybody? Well, that was Gulf Gate Mall. Yeah. Uh -huh. That was uh, NASA's headquarters. Was Gulf Gate Mall? What is currently Gulf, Gulf Gate Mall? Telephone Road. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Well, they, yeah, they had their, but the NASA headquarters <coughs> was not at. Sorry, go go game mall. It was, it was down in a little park, some place like that. Anyway, whatever. Uh, I have for, forgotten many, many more blades of grass than I have addressed in the last year. You know, so. Uh, and I have enjoyed every one of them. So I enjoy life. I enjoy living. I enjoy taking on a problem and saying, no, I remember figuring this out four years ago. I can't remember what I did. And I purposely didn't write it down. So now what what could what could the answer be? And then go back and maybe take a month before it all come, comes back, you know, to me. So, anyway, I love life. I love living. Uh, I love people. People are wonderful. They're coming in an almost uh, never ending variety. Each of them is a, a real, a real treat to be with. And you have to you have to learn to listen a whole lot more than you talk. I know uh, as fascinating as I seem to be, I'm I'm, I'm much less fascinating than than some of you folks are. So I've uh, I've in the last uh, month sent my grandson off to the, the uh, Naval uh, Naval Air War College 
up in the Rhode Island. I guess it's a Pawtucket or something like that. He wants to be a naval fighter pilot. <laughs> and apparently he's a, he, he, he does, he's doing well. And I'm really, really proud of him because he is a, a snap judgment type guy. He can think through a problem and the first thing that seems even likely as a probable solution, he can latch on to that and he'll have green monkeys and purple monkeys and, you know, lightning bolts and going all over the until he's worked out why it's the way it is. But uh, bless his arm, that's, that's the way it is. And he, he does give up when he he can't can't uh, figure it out. So. Can you can flag up so everybody can see it. Come in up so you can see the other side. Okay, so flag so everybody can see it. Oh, okay. There we are. Let's turn it to the other side. And I greatly appreciate this. This. Uh, Oh, award. Well, my Uncle Mac had one of these from the World War One, and now I have it. And my dad has one of these from World War Two, and now I have it. And uh, so and I'm going to keep this one. <laughs> now, now you have your own. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very, you know, very much. And uh, as we go over to to check and see if the beer is uh, still cold. Would you would you think about some topics that you'd like to hear from the NASA Alumni League or or from NASA in general? Because because uh, you know I, I don't mind going up to the ninth floor and say why the hell can't you all have a you know, answering questions about this bunch of topics? You know so. And then and they're very they're very interested in in doing that that kind of thing, but they're kind of walled off <laughs> and don't necessarily uh, see the whole picture. So, like 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 many of us. So. Well, um, I'd like to apologize for the technical uh, failure on the slides, but uh, I also want to say uh, that's completely my responsibility. <laughs> so, uh, I also want to uh, I want to again thank the McBerry family for for being here uh, and allowing us to present the congressional record and the flag. Um, we're honored that. Uh, so we got to know Jim and you, Peggy, and thank you very much for your time that you spent with us. And Norm, again, thank you uh, so much for all you've done for not only the community here at NASA, but for our museum and, and all the ideas that you've helped us kind of coalesce into actual programs. Uh, Kathy, thank you for coming along and keeping him focused when, uh, when we were on the road doing our road show. And, uh, I want to thank Anita Gale, since she's here, for uh, helping us with the uh, International Robotics Championship, uh, sending that team there to work. We couldn't have done that without your help. You and Norm. So, and I want to thank all of you guys for being here um, at, uh, at the Gilroo Center and all of those folks uh, that are out there in internet land. Um, thank you so much. I hope that we've... Uh, kind of shared a little bit about our mission, uh, a little bit about our, our accomplishments, and um, that our main purpose here today was just to simply acknowledge Norm and, and James McBaron and their, 
their contribution to mankind. So I'm going to turn this now over to uh, Ms. Spence. All right, we're almost done here. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would just like to echo my thanks for everybody and your patience. Um, internet strikes again. Yeah, yeah, we've had lots of fun with the connectivity issues, um, but somehow we survive. Um, believe it or not, today's uh, presentation has been recorded and we actually have two different versions of the recording. Um, so we're, we're gonna work to uh, make sure that what was actually recorded here in the room, it becomes available to the folks on the internet because we did keep dropping out. So hopefully we'll get a full recording. All right, so um, Norm mentioned beer. I don't know how many people were able to pick up on that, but he did mention beer. So right now, the only thing that's between you and the beer is me. So let me just say that our next first Thursday meeting is going to be on April 4th. It'll be right here again. Maybe we'll figure out the, um, the internet connection by then. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, we're gonna go ahead and conclude our meeting for today. Uh, look at that. I'm getting you out just a little bit early. So you have a little bit more time at the keg of the month over at the Blue Bonnet Pavilion. So please join us if you can. Thank you very much.